Good evening, I'm Rachel Floor, Executive Director of the John F. Kennedy Library Foundation. On behalf of all of my library and foundation colleagues, I am delighted to welcome all of you who are watching tonight's program online. To open, I humbly start with a land acknowledgement to recognize the indigenous tribes of the Pawtucket and Massachusetts people of the Wampanoag tribe, Tribal Confederation territories who both past and present and throughout many generations have stewarded the land where the Kennedy Library is today. While a land acknowledgement is not enough, it's an important way to promote indigenous visibility and it serves as a reminder that we are all on stolen and settled indigenous land. I invite all of us to contemplate how to better support indigenous communities and to learn how to honor and take care of the land that each of us inhabits. I would also like to acknowledge the generous support of our underwriters of the Kennedy Library Forums, lead sponsors, Bank of America, the Lowell Institute, and at and and our media sponsors, the Boston Globe and WBUR. We look forward to a robust question and answer period this evening. You'll see full instructions on screen for submitting your questions via email or comments on our YouTube page during the program. We are so grateful to have this opportunity to explore key issues affecting the future of cities with our distinguished guests this evening. I am now honored to introduce tonight's speakers. I am so pleased to extend a warm virtual welcome to the library to Dana Cunningham, the Pierre and Pamela Amadira Dean of Tufts University's Jonathan M. Tisch College of Civic Life. She has devoted her career to promoting civic participation, building community partnerships, and advocating for un underrepresented communities. Before leading Tisch College, she founded the Community Innovators Lab at MIT, where she built large-scale multi-sector development collaborations that combine sustainability, wellness, and democratic control of economies in marginalized communities. A civil, a civil rights lawyer by training, Dean Cunningham spent several years with the NAACP Legal Defense and Educational Fund, she has also served as an associate director at the Rock of Foundation and program director of the Elias Project at MIT. I'm delighted to extend a warm virtual welcome to the library to Edward Glazer. He is the Fred and Eleanor Glimp Professor of, of Economics and the chairman of the Department of Economics at Harvard University, where he has taught microeconomic theory and occasionally urban and public economics since 1992. He has served as the director of the Taubman Center for State and Local Government and director of the Rappaport Institute for Greater Boston. He has published dozens of papers on cities, economic growth, law, and economics. In particular, his work is focused on the determinants of city growth and the role of cities as the centers of idea transmission. His new book co-authored with David Cutler is Survival of the City, Living and Thriving in an Age of Isolation. I am also very pleased to welcome our moderator for this evening, evening's discussion back to the library virtually. Renee Loth is an opinion columnist for the Boston Globe. During her distinguished journalism career, she has held several high profile positions, including presidential campaign reporter, political editor, and editor of the Globe's editorial page. For seven years, she was editor of Architecture Boston Magazine, the quarterly ideas journal of the Boston Society of Architects concerned with issues of the built environment, urban design, and the public realm. She's an adjunct a lecturer in public policy at Harvard Kennedy Schools of Government, a former fellow at Harvard Shorenstein Center on Media, Politics, and Public Policy, was twice a judge for the Pulitzer Prizes in Journalism, and has reported from 14 countries. Please join me in welcoming our special guests. Over to you, Renee. Well, thank you. And greetings, everybody, and thank you for coming to this important discussion on the future of cities. Um, as someone who has lived in a Boston city neighborhood for more than 50 years, um, or just as somebody who loves cities, um, which I'm sure many of you in the audience do, um, I find myself sort of both equally worried and hopeful about the future of cities. Um, I'm worried because there's just so much uncertainty in this moment, um, but I'm hopeful that cities can uh, take this moment and maybe make some of the important changes that, that are necessary. 
Um, and we have a, you know, two terrific people here with us tonight to help us parse these, these questions. Um, I just want to like set the stage a little bit. Um, Cities, which uh, one of our panelists today, uh, Professor Glazer, has um, called man's greatest invention, um, the way they make us healthier, smarter, richer, greener, um, have really taken a pounding in the last uh, 20 months. Um, you know, downtowns have been hollowed out uh, as remote work has um, become more widespread. Retail is uh, faring even worse. Um, some cities, uh, Boston is not one of them, but uh, many cities have found the, such a decline in tax revenues uh, that they have not even been able to, you know, provide basic city services. Um, and then sort of beyond the uh, economic challenges, uh, the social value of cities, um, and here are one of our, our other uh, panelists, um, uh, uh, Dean Cunningham has described cities as cauldrons of democracy. Um, the, the sort of social value of cities is also uh, imperiled. I mean, you know, cities are the places where we gather to, you know, celebrate and to protest and to share spaces and try to live together um, and solve problems. And you know, but less so since the pandemic. So tonight we're going to be looking at both the economic and the social fate uh, of cities. Um, and uh, as you know, we're going to, you know, we'll be talking for about, I guess, about 55 minutes. Um, and then there'll be uh, time for questions from the audience. So please do uh, send in your questions. You'll see instructions on your screen how to do that. Um, and then I will be fielding those for the panelists in the last uh, half hour. Um, OK, so uh, Professor Glazer's book, um, and you will see from my many flags here, <laughs> how, how full of, of interesting insights it is. Um, he makes the, uh, the point about uh, how the vitality of cities has kind of ebbed and flowed through the centuries based on um, you know, circumstances that either attract people to cities. Um, for example, the invention of sewers, that was a big one, um, or you know, uh, skyscrapers or um, the streetcar. Um, immigration, um, and other forces that, that have from time to time, uh, you know, sort of driven people away. I'm thinking of highways, suburbs, uh, Zoom, um, possibly, you know, I would, I would add, uh, you know, discriminatory housing policies. So, so there is this kind of historic ebb and flow. Cities have their moments and then they, they sort of uh, tend to a little fade. So I'm wondering just from both of you, where do you think we are on this continuum right now? And um, where do you think we're headed? Either one of you can start. Dana, do you want to, uh, do you want to go first? That... No, 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 I want you to start. <laughs> okay, fair, fair enough. <laughs> so um, I, I would have said prior to, for most of the last 40 years, that we were in a remarkably centripetal, meaning pulling towards phase in cities, despite the fact that the cyber prophets and the techno seers um, like Alvin Toffer in the third wave mm -hmm. had predicted that you know, information technology was gonna disperse the urban knowledge workers just as transportation technology had already had dispersed the urban factories. And yet that sort of amazingly didn't happen. And I think the primary reason that it didn't happen was that what you know, all this technological change and globalization did was that it radically increased the returns to being smart. It radically increased the returns to innovation. It radically increased the returns to creativity. And we are a social species that gets smart by being around other smart people. It's our greatest talent. It's our ability to be intellectual magpies and to steal ideas from people who are around us. It's what we do fundamentally as people. And there's just no you know, replacement for being in the midst of a maelstrom of economic activity. And this is what enabled Boston to reinvent itself from a very you know, tired and declining city in the late 1970s, which was really feeling like a place whose glory days had been 150 years earlier, if not 250 years earlier, right, to a city that was a glistening capital of the information age. Now, you know, that feels very 2019. And I would have said even before 2019, there were fissures 
that were coming apart in that. And I, and I hope Dana, and I'm sure Dana will, will, will highlight some of those fissures, that in fact, the upside of Boston's rebirth was hardly being felt uni uniformly throughout the city. There was an affordability crisis that was true for many of our cities due to, in no small part, uh, housing policies that ended up pricing out uh, lower income people. Our cities were enabling you know, adults who came to the city to thrive in the, you know, as they saw their wages growth. But Boston, like so many of our successful cities, was doing a terrible job for its children, particularly our children of its children of poverty, who are, you know, uh, and that's a sort of standard feature for American cities. And this created, you know, a, a deep frustration with this city that in one sense was being successful, and then on, on another sense was failing at its sort of fundamental job of turning poor children into middle-income or rich adults. And then of course, COVID hit struck. And you know, there have always been these demons that come with density, these tremendous downsides of cramming people together. The most terrible of these has always been contagious disease. And you know, we responded to that by you know, social distancing, which if, if cities are the absence of physical space between people, then social distancing is the rapid fire de-urbanization of the world, right? And so we, we saw a momentary lull and that has still left our office towers empty. Um, I think I should probably stop talking now, but you know, my own guess going forward is that we will eventually get past the health crisis, but it's still gonna be work to get ourselves back into those offices. And it's gonna be even harder work to get ourselves back into those offices and at the same time, do a serious job of addressing the, fris the fissures that existed beforehand. So let me, let me stop at that point. Right, Dana. So I wanna first take solace in Ed's uh, admonition that it's really hard to say when you're in the midst of it. So um, exactly what we're facing. But I also, I, I want to put in a, a bet. And I, I have to say, I, I try to avoid binaries like centrifugal or centripetal. But, but I want to put in a plug for sort of existential threats driving us back into cities. And those existential threats are environmental crisis and the need to steward scarcer and scarcer resources and all of the efficiencies that cities bring. Um, and um, the need to address wealth disparities. Ed, you talked a lot about that. And figuring out how cities can sharpen the ability to generate wealth. And I would say wealth and ownership for, uh, uh, and, and sort of unleashing the poorest people in cities to generate their own wealth. So, so uh, to me, that's kind of the framework. Cities as centers for entrepreneurship, ecological stewardship, human and planetary flourishing. Um, but in order to do that, um, I also reflect on Ed's idea that it takes massive collective effort. And so I'm, I'm really drawn to this idea of what is the collect, what does it take to harness the collective effort to do those things. You know, you both mentioned um, the challenges that were here before the pandemic and um, that cities faced. And I'm, I'm reminded of something that the, the, uh, the head of the UN, uh, Antonio Guterres said, um, he compared the COVID-19 to an X-ray. He said, all it does is expose the fractures that were there in society or all along. Um, and, you know, plenty has been written about how COVID has just exacerbated existing conditions and, um, and made them visible to many of us um, for the first time. Um, so if, but also a lot has been said about how this moment, because it was such a wake up call globally, um, not for everyone, but um, for a lot of us, um, it could be a kind of reset button, a reset moment for uh, society, if we were trying to, if we were going to do that, if we were going to use this pandemic as a moment to reset uh, these inequities, um, where would you start? Where would either one of you, where would you start? So I'll start on this one. Um, I want to start by saying that my perspective is from the discipline of civic studies. And the idea of civic studies is sort of problems of collective human action and mm -hmm. the assumption that humans actually make their own futures, not just sort of impersonal societal forces driving human existence. So, 
So the question is, how do you harness the capacity for collective action and deliberation? Um, and, and, I, and I kind of like the framework, uh, Ed, that you set out about shared strength that serves, freedom to flourish, and humility to learn. That to me raises uh, a particular set of obligations of government. And I, and I look at New York City as an example. So most of the work I have done around kind of community engagement and civic work was in New York City. And in New York City, there was tremendous cooperation actually during the pandemic between citizens and government. And government really demonstrated its capacity to be there for its citizens. It fed a million people a day during the pandemic through 600 soup kitchens. It provided childcare for essential workers, 300,000 kids a day. It provided housing assistance. It had its own local housing eviction moratorium before the federal moratorium. It made PPE when it was not available at the scale that it needed and it incentivized local entrepreneurs to produce PPE. So, so I'm really interested in the ways that government and shared strength that serves also, um, it also uh, incentivizes and cultivates civil society. And then freedom to, what is the, it's uh, uh, freedom to flourish. Freedom to flourish. I, I am so flattered, by the way, that you that you know those words. I just can't I tell you how this, grateful I, I am. I love this framework. It's a it's a really. I mean, we're going to disagree on some things. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> but this uh, th these three elements, I think, are really um, helpful uh, to framing a, a strategy for survival. So, freedom to flourish, to me, has to do with unleashing ownership and entrepreneurship, not just for the typical entrepreneurs but for people who have had less access to entrepreneurial opportunity. You talk about that some in the book. And you know, at some point I'd like to talk about the practical examples of this, not just leave it on the, on the level of, of um, kind of ideas, but we'll, I'll come back to that. And then the last thing is this humility to learn and cities as learning machines. And for me, you know, I'm a huge fan of John Dewey. John Dewey talked so much about citizens' capacity to, um, the capacity to solve problems, you know, building the muscle for problem solving uh, for the purposes of democracy. So, uh, so I, I, I wanna kind of set that stage. I wanna come back to that, but that's, that's how I would start. I am, I am certainly not, not going to disagree with any of those comments. In fact, I'm going to enthusiastically endorse them. Uh, um, I, I want to just say two things insofar as that they relate to this. So um, one of which is just historical uh, material that is basically the story that we tell in the third chapter of the book, which is, it's mostly about New York. It's a little bit about London and, and other cities as well. But it's about this period, which is almost a hinge of history where pretty much for the last, for the, you know, for most of recorded history prior to 1800, pretty much all governments did was kill people, right? That's pretty much, you know, all that, you know, Frederick the Great, sure, he had co correspondence with Voltaire, but his primary business was killing people, okay? This is what they did. Then all of a sudden in the 19th century, we had city governments that actually started to save lives. And they started to save lives by investing in sewers, by investing in aqueducts, by actually making public health investments, which had an enormous impact. They were incredibly expensive. America's cities and towns were spending as much in 1900 as our federal government was spending on everything except for the post office and the army. But they were incredibly effective and incredibly valuable. Now, none of this happened from the top down. All of it happened from exactly what, what you know, the civic engagement that is so crucial. Now, in the 19th century, that civic engagement tended to be fairly elite. So Dr. Stephen Smith, the Bellevue doctor, who is so instrumental in, in you know, shining a light on the fact that even though you had the Croton Aqueduct, the tenements weren't connected to the water system, and that was why they were still getting cholera, and so you really needed to have a board of health that forced them. But you know, it was citizen engagement. I cannot you know, agree more with how vital that is today. That in fact, it needs to be a sort of widespread civic engagement with solving the problems of the city in a, in a practical way. And if I wanted to give, I think, 
all of these topics are vital. And, and, you know, I, if anything, you know, if I, if I sort of had one that I, I cared about most of all, it's probably in this, in the realm of education. And it's probably in re- making sure that children growing up in Boston, no matter where they live, no matter what, you know, what their parents do, have the chance to do amazing things that we do not lose what their talent can give our, our city and our society. But you know, I agree very strongly with the view that it is an outrage in this country that we make it so much harder to be an entrepreneur if you're a poor person than if you're a rich person. Because if you're a poor person, you, you know, if you're a rich person, you innovate in cyberspace. And, you know, there's nobody looking over your shoulder until you've got a billion users and have possibly hacked an election. If you're, if you're you know, I- innovating in the real world, if you're a real world entrepreneur, you're, you know, you're, you're faced against the, the huge re- number of, of just ordinary permits and you know various permitting entities who sit in the way of, of the creativity of ordinary Bostonians who just want to start their cafe, who just want to start their their uh, their their little store. And let me just add to that. I mean, if you're a if you own a little bodega, you're going to be uh, taxed for every can of Coke you sell. But if you're Mark Zuckerberg, you get to sell other people's data. For f- completely tax free. So, mm. just a, you know, on that level, there's just such a bias against the the small, you know, average entrepreneur. Sure. Not to mention the um, brick and mortar stores and the you know exactly. difficulty in retail. Exactly. Um, you know, you, speaking of civic engagement, and this also relates to the existential question of climate change. Um, what happens to cities' um, advantages in these areas when proximity and density becomes a danger or you know something to be avoided instead of a, a, an advantage? I mean, you know, um, people talk about how great it is that you can go to a uh, you know a, a development zoning meeting uh, by Zoom and people can can go who couldn't normally go because you know they were at home with their families or whatever, but. I have to tell you, it's not the same as being there cheek by jowl with your neighbors at a community meeting um, where you could like lean to your neighbor and say, is this guy making any sense? You know, which you can't do when you're zooming in from, from remotely. So, and of course, all of the advantages that cities have in terms of uh, climate change, you know, they're greener, they're denser, they're, people are taking transit, all of that. That's, uh, hasn't it been undermined by the, uh, the pandemic and the sense that that density and proximity are actually something that we need to avoid? Discuss. Yeah, I don't think it's possible to avoid it. I mean, that's just the reality of it. We didn't avoid it in the pandemic. It did cause more disease. Mm -hmm. And I I think there are um, sort of uh, immediate fixes like uh, more green space, more outdoor space. You know, we were involved in a project in Brooklyn, and I, I want to come back to this. But but we were it, there was affordable housing, and mm-hmm. one of the and uh, one of the demands coming out of the affordable housing construction was terraces, small amounts of outdoor space that enabled people just to have an escape and literally fresh air mm-hmm. um, for times of pandemic. So so there are simple things like you know, more green space around buildings, uh, you know, more terraces to give people outdoor and breathing space. I I don't think, I think that's just, um, that is a consequence of city life. I don't think there's a way around it. And it is the driver of democracy and innovation and stewardship. So I just, and I think that over time, we're gonna see the need to um, just, tolerate that risk because mm. it's the only way we survive as a species. Mm. Interesting. I, think, I think one thing that I, t- I take away from your comment, Renee, is the incredible importance of making sure that we make the health investments so that this doesn't happen again, right? This is hardly as if it's the first pandemic warning sign that we had. We had SARS, we had MERS, we had H1N1, we had Ebola. We had this steady drumbeat that said, look, it's coming. This is what happens when you globalize. Diseases you know, that start anywhere can go anywhere. And we, you know, did a little bit and then we stopped doing a little bit and then we did a little bit more. But, you know, we need to really recognize this is a major deal for us. And our our world gets hugely disrupted when new plagues come about. 
And as much as I like many aspects of the, of the infrastructure bill, I sort of would have thought the first thing to do was to figure out how to, how to put $200 billion into a permanent pandemic fighting sort of global fund that will think about how to, how to make this work. So you know, I, I really think that that is a vital protection for our cities and for our, our planet. I think we don't outrun pandemics, but um, Ed, you talked about uh, the resilience to crisis in part is, uh, is predetermined before the crisis, right? And it, it, it has to do with a, a stronger healthcare system that is based on maintaining health and not treating illness. It has to do with the availability of affordable housing. It has to do with decent benefit paying jobs. And so I think though we cannot outrun pandemics, we can create the social infrastructure around humans and human settlements and human families to make us as resilient as possible when the next crisis comes. I agree with that, but but so I, I, I don't know exactly what we can't outrun means. So if you mean the probability of having a pandemic will never go to zero, absolutely, you're 100% right. And we need to do those steps that you said to make sure that when something eventually happens, it will happen. I agree with that. But I also think we can lower the probability of, of a pandemic with smart policies. We can do more to create global alliances that monitor disease, monitor disease outbreaks. We can improve sanitary infrastructure in the developing world to make sure that we aren't breeding, you know, in uh, antibiotic resistant superbugs in the, the, you know, in, in the waters of, of Hyderabad. So, I mean, I think there are things that we can do on this and, and we should do them, but I agree with you strongly that they're never gonna drop the risk of pandemic down to zero. And, and consequently, we need to make sure that we have investments so that we're stronger, both as a health system and as a, as a society. Sure, because I mean, as Ed mentioned earlier, the, um, the investment in, in sanitation and sewers and um, you know, uh, fighting cholera in the cities was the beginning of the, the public health movement in this country. It was also an urban planning movement. Yes. And you know, the, the, uh, the modern day equivalence of that would be to have a you know, robust public health system, which we do not have in this country. And which uh, once again, the um, X-ray machine of um, COVID-19 just you know, uh, it exposed for us. Um, you guys are asking all of the questions and we're touching on all the topics that I've wanted to ask about. Um, you know, I, I, this is really kind of a little bit of a, uh, well, no, we're gonna go back to housing. Okay, I have something about housing. Um, because one of the, the more hopeful things I've seen is um, the prediction that cities uh, that have integrated their housing um, with people living in the downtowns, um, that they have a, a mix of housing, are more likely to come back uh, better from this pandemic than, than others because the, the, the downtown core will have some diversity in it and it won't all be hollowed out. It, all the eggs won't be in the basket of um, you know, commercial office space. Um, so I'm wondering a little bit about that. I mean, uh, how can cities that even haven't, uh, hadn't planned uh, their housing that way um, with mixed uses, can they catch up? Um, is it possible to design cities that are, are more, um, you know, that are more integrated that way in terms of uses of, of their properties? Sure. Yeah. Sure. Exactly. Sure. sure. Absolutely. Thing. Right. Well, first of all, you know, with 100 years of, of you know, hindsight, Euclidean zoning was just a big mistake. <laughs> I mean, just the whole idea that we were going to separate all the different uses of real estate into little little zones, it, it's just madness. I mean, there was an aspect of Euclidean zoning which made sense, which is if you have a stockyard, right, if you have a major polluting industry, you want to actually put that somewhere other than where children live or, or where adults live for that matter. But that's a separate thing than saying that, you know, you want your office towers to be somewhere else or you want anything else to be something else. Integration is good. And when you think about like uh, trying to make sure that our cities remain green. There is, if your alternative to a reduced public transit you know, system is everyone driving, which seems to be the normal default, then that's really bad in terms of carbon emissions. If your alternative is, well, we're gonna walk more or we're gonna bike more, that's not bad, that's fine. That's a perfectly good alternative, but that walking or biking requires people to live reasonably close to where they, where they, uh, where they work. It requires some integration on this. Um, so, Doing cities de novo, of course, that's straightforward, and I believe it will tend to happen as long as we don't have a zoning straitjacket, which stops the the, uh, the residences from being close to the commercial buildings. 
in cities that have highly commercial downtowns, it has to be either infill. Mm -hmm. um, and there's steady demand for you know, residences close to downtown, or it can be conversions. And certainly one of the possibilities that you know, may come out of a reduced demand for commercial space is that that commercial space can be then reutilized and turned into, um, turned into residential space. I think we're not gonna see that in Boston until the, the great laboratory boom of 2021 comes to the end where you know, we're trying to figure out how to turn every classy uh, office building into a new uh, lab for dealing with, with uh, uh, vaccine or other biological research, but eventually it's likely to happen. So I would also add that, you know, advanced manufacturing, cleaner manufacturing, in essence, um, also strengthens the possibility for that kind of mixed use uh, development. But, but, but the dilemma is actually a societal one of division. And, and this is, you know, I think one of the things that the pandemic made so clear is that technological and policy solutions will not address human resistance. Uh, <laughs> that is, I believe, grounded in race. And I think this is one of the places, Ed, where you and I are gonna disagree. This insider-outsider dynamic cannot be stripped of its racial dimensions. So when you just think of the kind of the discourse around the vaccine, readily available, life-saving technology, free, life-saving technology. And there is an ideological movement because it is coming from a government that advantages and um, supports, uh, I believe, urban minorities. You know, I think that was sort of the, a part of the ideological tone of this debate. Uh, is, is rejected. And it, 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 it's framed in a kind of libertarian garb, but underneath it is this sense that it's, it's the government of urban contagion and you cannot separate out urban contagion from minorities. And I see two perplexed faces looking at me, but let me just say this. Historically, I have used the term social distancing in a very particular way and Renee, you know where I'm going with this. For me, social distancing has always been about the ways in which minorities are considered less human. And it's a, it's a very kind of, um, what's the word? Uh, sort of internalized reaction. It, it is not a, um, a, a, a logical reaction, but, but it's, it's just holding at arm's length of people, of minorities uh, as being less than human. And that was enacted in a bunch of social policies. Ed, you talk about the FHA in your book and the racial coding of home loans. And this translates not just into loss of opportunity for people of color, it actually translates into wealth extraction because you see the ways and you name the ways in your book that middle-class whites vastly accelerate their wealth through the appreciation of housing values that was denied to people of color. And so, uh, and, and all the ways in which suburban development which I say was driven by social distancing and white fear and loathing, uh, uh, how that uh, was incentivized by the feds. So you get, and, 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 and so in, there's a lot of ways in which people of color are not outsiders. They've been insiders to cities for a long time. It's in some respects, whites coming back into cities who are the outsiders and the gentrifiers who are disrupting and displacing. And this is the Boyle Heights example. And I, I think, the, so the, the insider outsider dynamic is kind of flipped on its head in the Boyle Heights example. And it kind of illustrates what's at stake for minority communities in preserving their 
uh, you know, preserving their tenure in communities and fighting gentrification. So um, I, I think we cannot take on these deep social divides, these uh, more mixed use, integrated development approaches without really taking on the social dilemmas. And that's why I keep coming back to uh, civic infrastructure. So social distancing has a new meaning now. It's not just about that sort of dehumanization. It's also about a form of care, right? That you are maintaining social distance so as to protect your neighbors. It's a very different use of the term than the one I'm used to. But this new form of social distancing does also uh, sort of expose how the old forms of social distancing really uh, drove a lot of the disparities that occurred as a result of the pandemic. So there, there are many ways in which we, we absolutely agree. And I, I wanna highlight the ways in which we agree first before I, before I, I, um, I say the way, the, the, the way which I think is more modest that, that we actually disagree. So in terms of the role of race, both in terms of housing policies and in terms of America's larger decisions about redistribution and caring for poverty, I believe very strongly it is absolutely central that the precursor before you had the Euclidean zoning rule, you had the attempts of starting with Baltimore and then other cities to explicitly zone by race using language that is very similar to the language you just used in terms of, in terms of the, the social distancing completely. Um, it was only when the Supreme Court through a combination of, you know, laissez-faire, you know, un unwillingness to allow this abrogation of, of, um, individual property rights to build and you know maybe a little bit of concern for african americans but there was at least some at least a lot in there that was sort of a uh, uh the supreme court struck it down and then you have um you have zoning that comes up in different ways and achieves sort of similar results but it doesn't explicitly zone by race it implicitly does does things that are zoning by race now i would so that's in the specific housing realm i would say also that you know about 20 years ago i wrote a paper and then a book with my beloved colleague, Alberto Alessina, who actually died during the pandemic, not of the pandemic, but he died during, during that period, called Fighting Poverty in the US and Europe, A World of Difference, which very much argued uh, that you, know, you don't understand why the US is different than Europe unless you understand how race has so shaped American dialogue and American politics around redistribution whether or not we are talking about the, the story that C. Van Woodward tells about the strange career of Jim, Jim Crow and the use of racial uh, divides to basically you know, sap the populist movement in the 1890s of its energy to the 1960s and race appearing again and again as a force discrediting, uh, discrediting this. So I, I really believe this is huge um, and that it's, it's impossible to understand this without it. I guess I probably believe a little bit less than you that there were other factors, including federal subsidies that were also important in suburbanization. That um, in fact, there were people who went to the, went to the suburbs because um, you know, suburbanization occurred in cities that didn't have any substantial minority populations. And they were likely to be driven far more by you know, a desire for a fast commute by car and a desire for a little more land. But there's no question, certainly if we're gonna have a Boston perspective on it, the race is huge in, in this, absolutely. You know, I think I've got, I was looking around for books that I had which related to your, your thing that are right within easy reach on, on here. And, um, um, the um, the now where do we actually disagree? So um, I, I think that probably the most notable one is actually just the worry that I use the word insiders and outsiders. That the way that I use insiders is not a, a place based or or long term resident. I use it in the way that Manker Olson meant in uh, the Rise and Decline of Nations, which is inside to the makings of power. Right? They've managed to. to get control over regulation. They've managed to get control over, and for sure, a population can be inside an area and still basically excluded from the ability to control their own political destiny, right? They can be excluded from the ability to, to make decisions. And that's that's the way in which I meant insiders versus outsiders, although I, I find your, your juxtaposition intellectually interesting as well. 
Um, and I think the, the one policy way in which we divide is I, I didn't take a strong stand in the Boyle Heights view about you know, how much should be done to stop the gentrification of Boyle Heights. I took a strong stand against the people I think are the real insiders, who are the longstanding upper middle class Los Angeles homeowners, who are, as you say, overwhelmingly white, for whom regulations protect them and their neighborhoods from all change. They protect their housing values at high rates. And it's their inside power, their ability to stop urban change that I am very confident I want to do away with. Another area in which I think you agree, in a way, is that you both sort of think that government is the problem here, um, that um, that can be the problem here. Ed thinks that there's too much regulation and zoning and, and um, protective uh, covenants and so on. Um, and similarly, uh, Dana sees um, you know, in, uh, explicit and intentional uh, discrimination in housing policies. Um, I'm wondering if maybe the good news underlying this, this really serious dilemma is that, you know, these problems were created by people and governments, and so they can maybe be solved by people and governments, you know what I'm saying? It's, it's, um, we, we made this, this, uh, these bad decisions, we can unmake them. Yeah, what do you so, um, so first, I just want to say that sitting at the Tisch College of Civic Life, I would not argue that government is the problem. Okay. <laughs> I just, and I, and I, I worry a little bit about that language in this sure. moment of, uh, of deep antipathy toward government by you know, certain factions of our society. So I'm just That's very good. wary of that language. Um, and I really do believe that, for example, New York City stepping forward in the way that it did during the pandemic, that government has an essential role to play in fighting crisis and poverty. I just think it has often done a bad job. And in part that has been because of the kind of uh, political disfranchisement of the most um, marginalized. And so I would argue that uh, inclusive government backed and supported and held accountable by a very robust civil society is um, a key answer to, to our concerns. Um, and, but, but, but I also don't wanna fall into the divide of, well, um, the state has to handle everything, that there's, you know, that the only way to fight poverty is with government action. But, but, uh, but what's clear to me is that in the case of uh, uh, particularly um, uh, BIPOC people, that the government has played an active redistributive role away from communities of color. It has been a wealth extraction role. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so it's not, you know, I, we hear, you know, hear, well, redistribution isn't really the answer. And I'm, I'm, I'm not a huge fan of sort of those tropes, redistribution or, but, but, I, but I, I, I don't wanna shy away from the fact that there has been vast uh, redistribution away from minority communities and, and, and we can't ignore that either. It has to do with, uh, Renee, what you just said, that there were social and policy decisions made that can be unmade and uh, addressed through other forms of more enlightened social and policy decisions. And that's where we are now. I think that's where we have to be. I, I again, don't think we disagree on very much here. I, I'll just try and try and put, you know, a, a slightly different spin on this. Um, one of which is, I mean, a, a point that we try to make very strongly in the book is that we are, are both, you know, my, cut, my, my, my colleague, David Cutler, is traditionally further on the, on the left. I'm further on the center right. I've traditionally been on, on the sort of less government. He's traditionally been on the more government. I am so tired of those arguments right now. It's not the right time for those arguments. We should not be having those arguments at all, right? We need to have the argument that, you know, yes, the government has screwed up in, at times in the past, sometimes in a big way. That does not mean we need no government. That means we need better government, right? And, right. and the time for better government is now. OK, and we need to figure out how to do that. And I agree strongly that, you know, we can make things make things better. Um, I think that doesn't happen without serious citizen engagement. I, I do think there are areas in which, um, you know, e even within housing. So 
I, I think there are areas in which we really could just have less government. I mean, I think, in fact, in, in many areas in terms of land use regulation, we could just do less of it. But that's not going to do anything to address, you know, the massive homeless problem that exists in you know, many, many parts of this country. Um, that actually requires some active government engagement. Um, and if we're actually going to try and do something around upward mobility in the cities in terms of improving our schools, that certainly requires government engagement, reinvention, new things, but it also requires civic society because we have to realize that, you know, if we're thinking about sort of the big dollars coming from the feds, we've had two major attempts to have the federal government engage and fix local schooling in the past 20 years, right? Mm -hmm. No child left behind and raised to the top. Whatever you think about the merits of either of those individual policies, no one can claim that they fixed the, our nation's schools, right? That is that is a that is not a viable that is not a viable viewpoint. And we need something else that I think involves more learning and more ground up, uh, you know, community engagement. And this is where I would be most passionate about sort of trying to fix our cities. And when I think about all the ways in which. Um, you know, it was phrased about sort of harming communities of color. And I agree with that. I mean, I, you know, the history of our government and communities of color, particularly I mean, even worse so prior to 1865 is just awful, right? So it's not, there's not any, any lack of, of but it, it's also true that there are a specific set of things about American government, including subsidizing highways, including the home mortgage interest deduction, which, you know, by encouraging people to buy homes, you're essentially pushing them out of urban apartments into suburban homes. Uh, including the way that we structure our local schools, which meant that you know we, all parents who wanted to get away from uh, from urban schools just ran away to suburbs. All of this are ways in which the, our governments ended up harming our, our cities. And again, that doesn't mean that you know we don't need government. I mean, I, I, have, an, I have an old line, which is just as there's no such thing as, a, as an atheist in the foxhole, there's no such thing as a libertarian in the city. Right? <laughs> cities need effective government to deal with their problems, but we need a different. We need an improved government. We need a government that's better. You know, I'd love to give an example of some work we did that really kind of illustrates this collaboration. I don't know how much time we have, um, Renee. I'm looking at- We have about um, 10 minutes more before. Okay. Well, let me just tell you, this. the questions are coming in like fast and furious, so good. Okay. So I just want to give you this example, particularly of, um, Ed, I was really inspired by this idea of humility to learn. And I want to tell you about an effort that we were involved in in, in Brooklyn that was about build it ended up being about a learning what the community itself called a a, a culture of inquiry and so uh this was a multi-year organizing effort we did in uh to save a threatened safety net hospital we were working with labor unions we were working with uh clergy with community organizers and it began as an effort just to save the hospital and save jobs it becomes this extraordinary community-wide mobilization that focused on transforming a local healthcare system from one that dealt with the most dire and expensive uh, emergencies into a system that promoted health and that used the economic power of the local hospitals to drive uh, community wealth building. And so, uh, and, and a key thing was, so this was when I was at MIT, I have to say. A key thing was we trained a group of young people in participatory action research. We had them, they were from the neighborhood. We had them on the streets doing surveys, learning how to process the data, learning for themselves what the health status of the community was. We haven't talked much about this, but we had them focusing on the social determinants of health, mm -hmm. the core one being poverty. But having them understand and talk to their elders about what actually drives poor health and the constraining of choices that, are, that is structural not just sort of individual choice. Anyway, um, so they, they, they did this participatory action research. They created a report. They presented a report back to the community. And they made all of these recommenda recommendations. And I have to say there were MIT uh, public health and planning experts involved supporting this work. And so it, was, it really was a co-creation. 
But at the end of it, they came up with a proposal for affordable housing, access to healthy food, workforce development, and the governor's office in response, it was an election year. <laughs> <laughs> it was an election year, but the governor pledged a billion dollars to transform this space into a healthy, um, uh, a healthy, uh, you know, a health entrepreneurship zone in essence. One more thing I wanna tell you. We also attracted entrepreneurs. And one of the entrepreneurs just met with the hospitals and said, I'm just enamored of this idea of community ownership and the private sector and uh, working with the hospitals and with the community to solve local problems. What problem can I solve for you? The hospitals came up with this idea that they didn't, they had no way to track their equipment. So they had all this disused equipment, disrepaired all over the hospital systems. And he said, I'll solve this problem for you. And not only will I solve the problem for you, but I'll build an enterprise in a way that can create community ownership opportunities. He did that, this was all before the pandemic. He has the beta version in place in time for the pandemic. And the hospitals use this beta version to move respirators around the system during the pandemic. Mm. So this is just a beautiful example of civil society really organizing the hospitals, organizing the private sector, organizing government to, uh, to, to, to uh, improve its own health status. Um, and and I, so I, you talk in platitudes sometimes, it's really helpful sometimes to have very specific examples of what that could look like. And I just wanna say one last thing. At the end of it, we brought the students from, this is Bedford Stuyvesant and um, uh, Canarsie and um, uh, Brownsville. We brought a bunch of the kids to the MIT campus and we had them meet with our participatory action research class. So we have these kids who have actually done participatory action research on the street, meeting with our MIT masters and PhD students. And who is the expert in this room? You know, we were meeting in a glass walled classroom and you see like MIT folks walking by and seeing this room full of black and brown kids teaching the MIT graduate students about methods, research methods. Um, what a poetic moment. So it's, it's just to say they themselves created this idea of a culture of inquiry. And now whenever there's a question that comes up, the housing, the housing, affordable housing was one of the, it was in the 1.4 billion. The kids said, we have to do a, a, a research project to make sure we understand what the community needs. So that building a culture of inquiry Ed, I think goes to your point about cities becoming learning machines. Absolutely, that is an awesome story. Thank you for sharing that. And it's beautiful the way you brought it back around to the, the topic of, of cities and their unique um, you know, advantages and, and, and challenges. We have like just a few minutes before the questions. Um, we'd like to turn to questions because um, I'm getting them on my phone and they're just you know rolling in it's really great. Um, and thank you, audience, for uh, for sending these in. I guess I would just ask, you know, a kind of general, you know, closing thoughts in terms of. It seems to me that you know, the, of all of the lessons of the pandemic, and there have been many, the the one that sort of undergirds them all is our inter interdependence. You know how much we depend on each other, um, both in terms of keeping each other safe and healthy, um, and in terms of you know getting through this. Um, so, you know, we touched a little bit on some of this already, but like, what kinds of things do you think we can be doing to ensure that when the next pandemic hits, and it will, um, that we can be, as you said earlier, more resilient, you know, more, uh, more ready um, for, for those public health challenges that are ahead? And I guess, you know, kind of quickly. <laughs> okay, I, I will say something, but I think actually this is more uh, more Dean Cunningham's uh, wheelhouse than, than mine. Yeah. So um, uh, we've talked a, a bunch about public things that need to change, mm -hmm. um, but 
uh, in terms of the sort of connectivity of the city, that's more in everyone's hands. That's mm-hmm. more a question of all of us to, to make our cities more humane, to make them more livable. I mean, the good news is we've sort of learned about some really bad things that showed themselves during the pandemic. I mean, the, the health consequences of the pandemic were just wildly unequal in mm-hmm. society, just wildly unequal in terms of who died and who, who lived during this thing. Um, but we also, at least many of us learned how horrible it is, how just horrible it is to go months and months without, you know, smiling at a stranger in real life, without actually having a conversation with just, you know, an, an ordinary person that's, you know, next to each other on the water cooler. And then what a joy it was to be back live doing some things for those of us who have come back live. And so I think the most important thing is just to recognize that, that every human interaction is an opportunity to take joy in someone else and to build a connection and to, you know, to create that sort of, you know, civic web of interlocking friendship and shared experience that is ultimately the guarantor of of urban success. And just to add one last thing, uh, we didn't talk much about coming back to offices after this, maybe we will in the questions. I'm perfectly capable of going on for a long time about why I think you know that there's plenty of evidence on how we learn more when we're face to face and how that's a critical part of new ideas. But the real reason why I'm so confident that we're not going to move towards a Zoom future is just there's so much more joy in being alive. There's so much more joy in being around other people. Agreed. Even though this is very joyful <laughs> tonight, <laughs> but yes, agreed. Go ahead, uh, Dean. Uh, I- I completely agree with Professor Glazer. I have nothing to add. Okay. Um, so I'm looking at these, these questions here and um, I'm just gonna, uh, well, so there's a lot of uh, questions, I'm trying to group them uh, about um, out-migration from big cities um, that some of which is, was going on anyway because of financial imperatives, but were accelerated by the pandemic. And I, I myself read an article recently about Boise, Idaho being like the hot new place for, um, you know, refugees from California who couldn't uh, afford to work and live there anymore. Um, And uh, somebody was asking whether that, uh, the the political implications of that, you know, if you take all these sort of urban blue state urban nights and put them into whether it's Austin or Boise or um, these other uh, city, smaller cities that we hear are becoming magnets. Um, what does that do politically? You know, can that turn? You know, can we turn Idaho blue? Um, that's one question in that in that uh, bucket. Um, somebody asks, you know, will will smaller city, cities stay small, or will out migration from COVID make them bigger? It's a little bit of the, the same kind of question. Um, and uh, has the movement of remote eligible people? to non-city locations made living in the city more accessible uh, to lower income or service workers. Um, I don't see that. I personally have not seen that happen in Boston, but perhaps you know about uh, other, other places in the country. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna dive in for a few of those if you don't mind, unless, unless yes. do, you, do you want to do you want to, okay. So um, the, the, the pre-pandemic fact is um, you, you don't wanna think that big cities are actually losing net population. So there's always gross flows. There's always people leaving and people coming in. You're not seeing the 2020 census uh, seem to show us, which is mostly reflecting pre-pandemic mobility, showed us that cities continue to by and large grow. Um, the, there's still more growth in medium density locales. So it's not that you see sort of people o- occupying the great empty spaces between the oceans, but if you're just gonna sort of rank the deciles of American density, there's more growth in the second decile, meaning the, the of, of counties rather than the top decile. So it's sort of a humpback shape where we're still having people moving out of the really do- low density areas, but they're moving into the sort of exurbs, the sort of mid density, mid sized cities, the Atlanta, Dallas, Houston, Phoenix is more than they are to Boston. No small part of that is the fact that they make it much easier to build. The fact that these cities make it just much easier to mass produce housing and provide lots of affordable housing for ordinary Americans that is just, you're not gonna find in, in the Boston metropolitan area. Now, what do we know about pandemic mobility? Shockingly little. Okay, what we know at really high frequencies is from post office changes of address. The real problem with post office changes of address is for all of the 
five years pre-pandemic, they also showed a mass exodus from cities. OK, so it seems as if, in fact, when people come into cities that where we know there was no mass exodus happening. So it seems as if when people the people who move into cities, maybe younger, maybe uh, busier, are less likely to register that they move there, whereas the people who move out of cities are more likely to register that they've moved out of the city. And so we, we want to be cautious about that, that data. That being said, I, I certainly know there's been some out migration. The question is, how permanent is it is it going to be and what should we expect from this? So. I tend to think that for a city like Boston, your housing prices were so high prior to, to COVID-19 that before you see an actual shrinking of Boston's population, you see housing prices fall. The same thing is true of commercial rents, right? That you have this clear price adjustment that as an economist, I'm, I'm you know, supposed to believe very strongly sort of causes the market not to leave to large scale vacancies or large scale numbers of apartments going, uh, going empty. I think in the short run, that's all been disrupted in lots of ways because the, the markets have been sort of moved up. And indeed, you know, as your comment suggested, we haven't seen a major correction in Boston housing prices at all. It hasn't gotten more affordable at all. Maybe it will, uh, but certainly we haven't seen that yet. Now, which places will benefit from this and who will move out? So when you think about this sort of urban exodus going that went on and the urban exodus that can go forward, you first of all want to remember that Zooming was not a universal thing in the American population. Even at its height in May 2020, which was the apogee, the, the apex of Zooming in America, you know, you, you had 50 million Americans who were Zooming. Those Americans who had advanced degrees, 68.9% of them were working remotely. Those Americans who were high school dropouts, 5% of them were working remotely. Okay, so this was a wildly unequal thing. And even though Overwhelmingly, the majority of Americans have gone back to work. So we've gone from 50 million Americans working remotely to under 20 million. So downtown Boston gives you a misleading sense about how much America as a whole has gone back. Those education cleavages have gone back, have continued. So we, we should expect to see skilled people being more unmoored. I don't think that you know your Kendall Square startup is going to say, oh, let's just move all to our houses in Framingham and Sudbury and just dial it in. But I do think they may decide let's all move to Austin because it's you know we don't have to pay taxes and because it's got better winters, or let's all move to uh, Vail because we like skiing. Now this means that you know talent is mobile, businesses is mo are mobile. But they're not going to move to sort of every mid-sized city. They're going to move to the kind of places that highly educated people like to go beforehand. They're going to move to high amenity areas that are sort of competing to attract talent. And that means that it's unlikely to be much salvation for mid-sized Rust Belt cities. But yeah, you know, university towns, resort areas, areas that have you know, done a good job of attracting skilled people ex, ex ante before COVID, they're going to do well out of this ex post. And I think the lesson of that for Boston is we've got to fight to retain our talent because it is more mobile than it has been in decades. And I would just- Go, ahead. Go please. I'd just add sort of philosophically, I am wary of arguments about smart urbanites like us going to the red states and colonizing to take <laughs> back America. Uh, that kind of narrative line, I think really disregards sort of a lot of the important information that we have to figure out how to assimilate and address about suffering in the heartland and, and the legitimate claims and worries uh, and struggles of the white working class in the heartland. Um, we're not gonna get there by just <laughs> an urban elite <laughs> column. I mean, I don't think I agree with Ed, that it's not possible. I mean, that's not the way it's going to work. But I also think, sort of politically and philosophically, it it is an um, it is it is an effort at a sure, and it's a rather sort of arrogant and high. I I, I don't mean that. I, I don't want to say it that way, but that it, it's it's a yeah. it's a shortcut around the really important work of building political unity in a deeply deeply divided country. Right. One I, of the actually, I agree very strongly. I think that's that's a. a, a remarkably wise statement just I, 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 but I want to highlight just one thing from my narrow housing mm -hmm. world the one thing that I see happen when you know elite Californians move to Austin Texas is they start working on creating barriers to building new housing and in fact that's that's so so far from being some helpful but I think they try to figure out how to lock how to make sure that you know there's no no people who are poorer than them who are moving into the area so uh, one of the questions was about um uh, the sort of rural versus urban divide and um, how much of the polarization is today in that divide. Um, 
and the question was just what does this mean for the future of cities and their role in promoting inclusion and better communication? And similarly, somebody must, I hope, um, in the audience be from the South, um, because I think we have a, you know, and this is the, here we have the benefit of remote uh, civic activities because, you know, the, this Zoom is going out all over the country, um, perhaps all over the world. Um, so somebody asks from, possibly from Charlotte or Charleston, um, how can Southern cities like Charlotte and Charleston become more competitive and prepared for uh, future challenges? Um, uh, it talked a little bit about that, um, have the amenities that attract the, the uh, um, you know, brainiacs, um, but are there other, are there other concerns? other ways to become the big, the cities, the successful, most successful cities of the future. I don't wanna, I don't wanna leap on, do you want, do you want me to go first? Is that, uh, okay, okay, absolutely. Um, so um, I would have said prior to COVID-19 that in fact, some of the most successful, most competitive cities in the country are exactly places like Charlotte, are exactly places that managed to combine the sort of Southern pro-business thing with a pro-education thing. Right. And that proved, you know, remarkably successful at attracting, you know, uh, businesses, various types of entrepreneurs. It may not be entirely, you know, that there are maybe other issues that people have with, you know, the Atlanta falls in this category. Uh, Austin certainly falls in this category. Um, there are other issues with this. Right. So it's certainly not a particularly envir environmental lifestyle that's being pushed with this. Um, many of these places are not doing well in terms of social inclusion or upward mobility for the kids growing up in those areas. So there certainly are downsides. But if you're focused just on attracting businesses and creating sort of an economic engine, I would have said these places are doing pretty darn well uh, prior to, to COVID. I don't know what post-COVID will mean for that, but I think that the combination of having, you know, policies that are focused on um, Education, hopefully education, not just at the high end, but education for everyone, hopefully education for, for you know, children uh, who are born in poverty with policies that are pro-business. And again, hopefully not just pro-businesses that are big and visible, but also businesses that are, are small scale entrepreneurs. That's a pretty good combination. Um, but at the same time, you know, as we've been discussing throughout, these cities also have, you know, cleavages of inequality, cleavages of racial division that also need, need fighting as well. I mean, the fact that cities are unequal is an ancient fact. I mean, it was Plato who wrote in the Republic that every city of whatever size is in reality two cities, one a city of the rich and the other a city of the poor, and they're perpetually at war with each other. And in a sense, there are aspects of urban inequality that are even laudable in the sense that, you know, cities can you know, be unequal because they attract rich people because they're fun places to be rich and because they attract poor people with the ability to you know, have access to a better safety net or the ability to find opportunity and employment. And you know, Dean Cunningham was talking about the, the pain of the, the heartland. I, I've certainly written on this and you know, the massive rise in prime age joblessness, which is centered in America's Eastern heartland. It's not centered in, in the cities of the coast. It's centered, centered right there. And it's, it's, you know, it's an awful, awful thing. Um, and you know, prior to COVID-19, I was always fairly optimistic that entrepreneurs in cities like Boston would figure out things for people who didn't have an MIT degree to do in the future. They'd figure out part of the great urban service economy, what they could do. I didn't know what they were going to do in, in Eastern Kentucky. I didn't know what they were going to do. I mean, there's no, there's no manufacturing future there. The mining is, is largely automated. And so um, these areas are, are you know, uh, deeply suffering, and it's, it's very hard to figure out what to do, uh, what to do about them. Yeah, somebody asked something somewhat similar to that, and it's a little bit, there's a little bit of a tone of despair in here, but, um, you know, how can, we talked a lot about citizen engagement and citizen action um, and better government, how this person asks, can we, can citizens be engaged with such basic divides that we have in this country now where, you know, you can't even get people to agree on a life-saving um, vaccine, as as uh, Dean Cunningham mentioned right at the beginning, that the now I'm now I'm editorializing, but the vast distrust of expertise of um, you know of uh, the elites of whatever it is uh, um, that is 
of each other that is in abroad in the land, um, how do we address that if, if we believe as we all do that, that civic engagement and the, 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 I don't know, the frisson of cities uh, is, a, is a basic good. You know, let me give you the example of Kentuckians for the Commonwealth and um, the and the whole uh, sort of um, movement of rural electric co-ops that's happening right now. So there is, uh, you probably know that the rural electric uh, uh, infrastructure was built during the New Deal and it actually was designed to be community owned. There was a huge infrastructure that went with it that was for education, uh, for um, uh, training around entrepreneurship and development and, uh, and finance and built a vast infrastructure. Today, most uh, land mass is still in the US is still covered by the rural electrical co-ops. Well, many of the co-ops have been co-opted by the utility companies and, and they're very focused on perpetuating coal and dirty fuels and extracting the last pennies from poor um, ratepayers, even though they are owned by the ratepayers technically themselves. And there's a movement in many parts of the South in particular to take back the governance of these community owned assets and turn them towards renewable energy. Now, this is a Herculean task. I'm not suggesting that this is a easy, romantic, quick fix. But this idea that um, citizens understand that and owners understand that they are not actually getting the benefits of ownership, that they don't get to direct their destiny uh, as, um, uh, as, as owners of these facilities and that they are missing the chance to play a role in environmental stewardship in many cases is quite an inspiring project. Um, and so um, I think I would, uh, I'd wanna bet on um, more widespread ownership opportunities and common cause around things like stewardship and the future that, um, that you know, projects that address immediate needs uh, are ways of bringing people together across ideological lines. You've got to figure out your power, literally your power infrastructure. Uh, and you've got to come up with something new other than coal. And you can't just have a strategy to boycott coal and shut down the mines. It is a culture and a livelihood and a way of life. And coal miners themselves will need to figure out what the next phase and a more renewable, sustainable phase looks like. So, so to my mind, it gets back to kind of really investing and having faith in the innovation capacity of people closest to the problems and incentivizing and um, enabling their ownership of the assets that, are, that can drive that kind of process. So was this a spontaneous um, thing that came up or was there community organizing behind it? Or, I mean, somebody- oh, no. Definitely, a I mean, there's a whole, this is a long, really interesting yeah, story. There must have uh, some leadership in there somewhere. Oh, uh, well, yeah, it was, it's community organizing and mm -hmm. leadership of the community members themselves. They looked, um, a group, uh, the Mississippi NAACP looked at what was happening in Mississippi. The Mississippi Republican Party has become the greatest beneficiary of the local rural electrical co-ops, which are largely black owned technically. And the black owners and ratepayers are funding a Republican party that reliably votes in Mississippi against the interests of the black owners. Mm -hmm. So this is just a question of asserting your right as an owner to directing the use of your assets. Um, but, you know, but what it will take politically to make that happen uh, is a bigger story. But, but, it's, but it's an interesting one about the intersection between economics, organizing, and politics. And climate change. I and mean, climate change. That, you know, and, and there are some questions in here about, about that. Um, 
particular to Boston and other, other coastal cities. It's a little, I'm leaving you behind a little bit, but, um, you know, which are at risk of, of inundation, it says here, because of sea level rise. Um, uh, this, is a, uh, this is an interesting question. It's gonna segue nicely into a discussion about Michelle Wu as the new mayor of Boston. So, um, cause there's two questions at the beginning and end that dovetail nicely. Um, it, it, this questioner asks, how do you focus attention on an existential threat like climate change when there are so many more immediate concerns i.e. COVID um, that are, you know, in our, uh, right in our faces. And the question at the end here, uh, what would be your top three recommendations to Michelle Wu as she begins her tenure as mayor of Boston? And of course she, um, I think already, she's been in office exactly today, <laughs> um, one day, um, is, is trying to, to realize uh, both a existential, very large uh, visionary idea about Boston and um, promising to fix the potholes. So um, can we do this? Can it be done? What, what are you, do you have any advice for her? What are your recommendations for her? And uh, in that earlier question, how can we hold these two ideas in our heads at the same time, this existential threat and the more immediate threats? So I would just argue that um, increasingly with climate, uh, existential and immediate are merging. <laughs> um, and maybe not as much in the temperate Northeast as other parts of the country. But, you know, I think most coastal cities are going to have to plan a whole different approach to coastal management and uh, to you know, I mean, in essence, I think we're at the point where we have to figure out how to let the water in and survive. Yeah. So yeah. what does that look like? That's a massive planning task. It's also an opportunity for entrepreneurship and innovation. What, I mean, Venice did it, <laughs> you know, look what, <laughs> Venice is a world-class city in many ways, right? So, so how do you design for environmental resilience, I think, is a really fascinating and um, exciting and dangerous challenge. And, and I, so I think I would, that's one piece of advice I would give uh, to Michelle Wu. What does it look like for you, for example, to design to let the water in? You know, what's your role in facilitating that? From my days working at the Architecture Magazine, I can tell you that there's a lot of really good thinking in the city of Boston on exactly this question, letting the water in. We did an entire issue on it. Um, and, uh, you know, but it's expensive and it does require a whole new way of thinking about property ownership and um, development rights and all of this kind of stuff. And transportation. Indeed. Um, uh, and, and even down to the level of, of um, you know, small decisions like putting the, the uh, HVAC cooling on systems on the roof, right? Um, so, which we're, we're not doing. I mean, it's, it's in regulation for future development, but existing, you know, developments are all grandfathered in. So I just um, want to say that all of these things are actually opportunities for wealth creation. Mm -hmm. If we think about them properly, and if we figure out ways to incentivize community ownership of some of these uh, new kinds of adaptations, I think the possibility is that we are, um, you know, we are generating through stewardship opportunities for greater economic inclusion. What do you think? So uh, I was I was looking back to so I was on a, a mayoral committee on climate change. I was trying to figure out what year it was. I think it was 2011, 2012, something like that. Here in Boston. At, here in Boston, yeah. Uh, um, and I was uh, I was remembering those meetings, and they were they were funny things because you get rolled together, adaptation and mitigation. Adaptation is sort of you know doing your best to to make Boston relatively you know able to get through climate change, mitigation is reducing our carbon footprint. The problem with rolling those things together is lots of people have great ideas around mitigation. You know, everyone has an idea for where they want a new bike lane or what else they're gonna to do to sort of, sort of green stuff. Whereas, that, as you just said, there are good ideas about them, but they're technical in fact. 
the 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 ideas around actually protecting you from from storm surges uh, that's actually a, a hard technical engineering thing to do and so it's it's harder to sort of combine uh the two things together now i think there's value to combining them i think it's value to in the sense that it's value to have ordinary citizens involved with both both things but i do think they need to be kept separate going forward we need to recognize that while we should always think about what we can do for mitigation and cities are part of the solution right for reducing carbon emissions right putting people together in dense areas reduces the extra transport and by living in smaller units we involve in less you know less less carbon emissions to heat and cool our, our areas um but as as was just said you know we need to be working on adaptation today we need to be thinking about how to make sure that we are protected, how we're going to make sure that we're not going to build in a way that's going to make us more vulnerable. And that clearly needs to be something that's big going forward. And it also needs to be something that involves both technical expertise, and that needs to be there and obvious. But it, the community needs to be brought along, not just because they're going to need to approve of the thing at the end of the day, but because they'll have smart way, things to bring it in. I mean, engineers think of engineering solutions for problems they view as engineering problems. But these are not just engineering problems. These are social problems. That's and right. it, they're going to they're going to sort of impact society in lots of different ways, and so they really do need you know regular Bostonians to be engaged in that, and that sort of really is is central. Now, in terms of advice for uh, Michelle Wu, I, I don't you know I have I have been privileged to know Michelle Wu since she, she was a Harvard undergraduate. She took uh, my intermediate micro course, and she was a, a she was a fabulous student, um, and I am of course extraordinarily proud of that fact. Um, and it's, uh, I think she will know what to do, but the important thing about, you know, making wise decisions is to not think that you're making them on your own. And I think that's a running theme of this conversation, that you want to sort of have the humility to learn. And that means you want to, you know, talk to a lot of different people. You want to talk to people who have technical expertise, and you want to talk to people who have no technical expertise whatsoever, and just have, have a sense of, of, and all of their voices are important. I mean, it is true that you know Menino was beloved. One of the reasons why Menino was beloved is what do we think the number was, Renee? That half of Boston had met him personally and talked to him. It was something. It was something more, 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 than, more that. than that. It was something like that. That was a huge part of what what he did and what he was good at. Um, and that's that's a really important thing to keep going. That the sort of more that you know the mayor becomes the the prisoner of government center, uh, the more likely this this fails. And you, she's got to you know continue to connect with people and continue to, to you know, uh, recognize that the, the whole city is a source of great strength for her and a source of great wisdom for her. Last thing I'll say, I don't really know how to fix the fissures between red state America and blue state America at all, but I have a very strong sense that, you know, the answer is by having people from different communities come together to solve common problems. But I think that that is exactly right. And I want to just echo that. And, you know, I continue to believe that, you know, as Mayor Fiorella LaGuardia of New York said, there's no Republican or Democratic way to fix a pothole or to clean up the streets. And for goodness sakes, there should be no Republican or Democratic way to fight a pandemic either. Right. I mean, it's, it's an absurd thing that that. Um, but, um, you know, in Boston, at least. I think engaging people who voted for her, and there are a lot who did, as you just said, but there are some who didn't, but getting them all involved in you know, trying to fix the real problems that the cities face, that feels like the best way forward to sort of you know, unite the city and make it stronger going forward. Yes, because I mean, she will have not only uh, the twin challenges of, of large scale visionary problems and small potholes, but you also have the problem of sort of the inside game and the outside game, right? So the, the 91,000 people who voted for her and the many, many who did not vote at all um, on the outside and then all of the, the um, I don't know, bureaucracy, at, for lack of a better word, inside the lobbyists, the, um, you know, the, the smart guys who run the city, um, they shall have to work with them too. So that's a, it's a real challenge to her and to, I think, um, anybody, but the potential for, uh, you know, for taking this critical moment, right, this post-pandemic moment, let's, I don't even want to say post-pandemic, but emerging out of the pandemic moment um, to, to think big thoughts, uh, as we have done tonight, um, is really uh, kind of thrilling. And um, I don't know, I, I might even have that be the last word. Um, it's it's a exciting you know time. It's it's frightening in a way, but um, I think I think we're all of us who love cities are looking forward to getting back at it. Um, so 
I guess I just want to thank all the um, viewers we've had. I don't, I don't even know how many, there are a lot, um, and uh, for their really thoughtful questions and uh, for their commitment to um, civic engagement right here and, and to cities. And of course, thank you, Dean Cunningham and Professor Glazer um, and the Kennedy Library for being such important conveners for these conversations. So I guess I'll say goodbye for now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.